Hello and welcome to another episode of the Cam Johar Show, where we bring you inspiring guests with incredible stories that they share with us of their lives and trials and tribulations. And today, my guest is no uh, exception to that. So welcome to the show, Peter Bell. How are you, Cam? Very well, thank, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Very well, thank you. You're welcome. So welcome to West Bromwich. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> How was the drive down? It was nice, yeah. Was very, it okay? Very leisurely. Good, good. So, Pete, incredible story. Mm. You know, real kind of rags to riches to rags. Yeah, rags to riches, <laughs> back into rags, back to riches again. <laughs> yeah, been through it all, right? Yeah. So, times. for full disclosure, um, I've known Pete for about three years now. Yeah, yeah, been yeah, three years. Good friends, so business partners. Yeah, very good. Yeah, excellent. So, where did it all begin? Because the interesting thing is that, you know, your, uh, your parentage is quite interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so tell us about that. So my, well, my, my mother was born in Egypt, Cairo. Mm -hmm. um, my father was born in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, they got married young to mid-twenties, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, had two amazing children, myself and my sister. Yeah. And then they went their separate ways. Um, so t essentially, my, my mother brought, brought us up my, myself and my sister on her own, really. Mm -hmm. So she kind of single-parented. My father had very, very little influence on our lives as we were growing up. Okay. Was um, there a lot of influences that your mum used from, from back home in Egypt or was it purely a very British kind of upbringing? We had a very British upbringing, okay. yeah. My mum, she's easily influenced by outside sources, so she brought us up in what she believed was the best way possible. Of course. Um, so she kind of followed the culture of the country that we were in. We, you know, we were born, myself and my sister were born and bred in mm -hmm. the UK. Um, so she followed the trials and tribulations of how UK families live and survive. Standard education, you know, leave school, get a job, um, buy a house, that kind of it's thing. It's the mantra, isn't it? Yeah, the mantra of how English down, people get live, married. You know, settle down, get married, have, have kids. a couple of children. I was always the black sheep of the family, though. I did everything. Really? The, yeah, I always did everything the wrong way. Myself and my sister were like two complete polar opposites. She went to school, did her A-levels, went to university met a boy, got married, bought a house, had two children and now lives happily ever after. Me, on the other hand, I dropped out of school at 15, didn't have any GCSEs, um, didn't really know what I was going to do, um, kind of went from job to job here and there, started up my own business, met a few women as you do, never got married, had a child out of wedlock, bought a house. So I was definitely the rogue black sheep of the family, to be so, honest. So tell me something, if environment is everything, we talk about that all the time, don't we? Mm. Right, that you are the, the product of your environment. So you and your sister are, are the product of the same environment, yeah. and yet by your own admission, went totally in opposite directions. But we, we were and we weren't the product of the same environment. Okay. So my sister was always given everything that she wanted. Okay. So she always went on the school trips. Um, when she went to university, that was paid for by my parents. They could only afford to send one child to university, so the first one went. Okay. When they went on holidays, she was the one that went on the holidays with them. So I always l missed out on things, and everything was always handed down to me. So I was the guy wearing the girls' trainers, the girls' jeans when I was younger. So for me, my struggles were always that when I was old enough, I wanted to be able to earn enough money not to be in that situation where I couldn't do the things that I wanted to do. Mm. So we did have two, although we were in the exact same environment, we had two very different upbringings as well. That's really interesting because, you know, a lot of our viewers will identify, mm. whereas, it, you know, most of the Indian community would lean towards favouring the boy, even if he was younger. Mm. And yeah. so lots of girls out there will, will be resonating it with was, your story right now. It was definitely the opposite way yeah. around in our family. My, my sister was always favoured, um, you know. It's very much the other way around now, though, mm -hmm. um, because I went through many, many struggles to get to where I am today. Yeah. I'm now almost favoured for going through those struggles and coming out the other side and having something successful. And now my sister often says to me, oh, it's not fair you have all the things that you want in life, that's not fair. I, I didn't have any different upbringing. The only difference was is that I had the drive to do what I wanted to do to get there because I didn't want to be, I wasn't happy Where with what I had. Where do you think that came from? Was, was there resentment for your sister that she um, had all these things? And, and did she have the love and affection as well? Um, uh, 
Yeah, maybe. Mm-hmm. She she definitely, I mean, it's certainly when I was younger, it felt like she had more love and affection. Sure. Um, you know, my, even down to things like my parents would sit down with her and help her with her school homework, and I was left to my own devices. Yeah. Peter, what, look, you know, we're, we're dear friends, right? Mm. What do you think causes that? Because I, I experienced that quite a lot in Asian cultures where there is a favourite child, and you said, I was a black sheep. As a parent, I mean, I'm a parent of, of twins, as you know, mm-hmm. and the worst thing that I can ever imagine is favouring one over the other. Ha- and and this, this was happening quite openly in, in terms of, like you said, yeah. we can only afford to send one of them you to university, mm-hmm. so it's going to be a sister. Why do parents do that? Because if I couldn't afford to send both of my kids to university, none of them would be going. I think, I think certainly in our family, when we were younger, um, you know, my sister was very, she was a good child. Mm-hmm. She, was, she would be the prime example of a good child, I would okay. say. Um, and I wasn't. Right. I just wasn't. I was a handful. I was not a nice child. You know, I was always in arguments with so my So tell me something. Mm-hmm. Were you, was she good because she was treated well? Or, and were you bad because you, or was it, which came first? The bad behaviour? I could blame it on that. I would probably say my bad behaviour came first. Okay. Um, you know, I was always in trouble with the police. I was always sneaking out of the house. Um, you know, so I would say my bad behaviour came first. Okay. And then my parents' lack of knowing what to do with me came afterwards because I was a handful. I can't lie about that, you know. Do you think it, it was just that the fact that they didn't understand you or you genuinely misbehaved? Uh, no, no child genuinely misbehaves to, mm-hmm. to do it on purpose. Yeah. Children just don't do no. that. They don't understand what they're doing is wrong. Um, and, you know, I've had some very, very good friends on the way up the food chain that have taught me the difference between right and wrong, mm. how to conduct myself, how to behave even. Um, you know, and for me... I don't think I had enough discipline from my parents okay. to really kick me into touch mm. um, and to really educate me in the ways of how the world were. You know, I was I was nine when my father left home. Um, you know, so for me, I, I I lost what was a big chunk of my upbringing. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, do you think as a boy, as a male, that it's more important to have a, a father figure in your life? Do you think your sister benefited from the fact that? It was your father that left and your mum was still there. Were they close because of that? Um, yeah, I would definitely say that certainly as a boy, you, you yeah. look up, you look for a role model. Mm. Um, and I find myself doing it now yeah. in today's day and age. Even even as a grown adult now, I still find myself looking for role models. Mm. You know, we, we disguise them as mentors um, in, in society today but what you're looking for is a role model mm. you're looking for somebody who you can look up to who you aspire to be like um, and I think when you don't have that at a young age that's where your problems can start you know you have nobody to look up to mm. and your lessons come from your parents of you course know? well that's the model of life that yeah. you see isn't it yeah of course it is of so course you, it is. You, you leave school at 16 mm. little or no I was 15 actually 15 yeah, wow 15 yeah okay. I dropped out didn't do my GCSEs right. well I kind of sat in the room and I was present <laughs> didn't and, really do them and there's a time in education where teachers didn't particularly care did they if, they, yeah, if you didn't want to do anything go my teachers always told me that I would end up as a bum I always nothing. said that I would amount to nothing I'm you will go nowhere in life. Yes. Um, you know, you, you can't barely spell. You're not very good at reading. You have very little attention for work. Uh, I was always told that I would go nowhere in life. What did that do for you? For me, it mm. actually drove me to okay. prove them wrong. So you used that. Yeah. But so when, it could have crushed you, couldn't it? Yeah, it could have crushed me. Yeah. Uh, but I've never really listened to that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I had a drive and... You know, I I want to say that my drive is to earn money, but that's not strictly true. Mm -hmm. I have a passion for what I do, which is largely helping others in the work that I do. Mm. Um, And for me, it's that that drive is what what takes me there. Fantastic. So tell us about the early years of of being um, a a young man in Northampton. Early years of being a young man in Northampton. Well, you know, I did. I started off. You know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I left school. Of course. But I liked cars. So I did what most young boys would do. I got an apprenticeship um, at a garage. Um, 
I worked there right through to the point actually when they when they shut down. I used to work for Henley's Rover, uh-huh. um, part of the HMG group, and they went into liquidation when I would have been, I think, nineteen or twenty now. So quite a while back now, um, and I was with them right to the end. Um, but something that happened to me, which was a real game changer for me, was I broke my arm. Okay. Would have been. I think about 18 now, I broke my arm. So I couldn't work on the shop floor fixing cars, um, which is what I was there for. That was my apprenticeship. Okay. Um, and they they gave me an opportunity. They were short-staffed and gave me an opportunity to work on their reception desk. Right. Um, it was all I could do. I couldn't lift gearboxes, couldn't fix cars, couldn't do anything, but I could answer the telephone. Um, you know, I was nervous as anything. Sure. Um, but that, for me, that was, a, that was probably a turning point in my life because I then realised that Actually, I didn't enjoy working on cars as much mm. as I did helping people out. Mm-hmm. It was for, you know, I was probably the lowest of the low at that point in that job. Um, but I went from working on their reception desk to being their warranty manager, to being their workshop controller, to eventually then being, um, to them being one of the service managers. So you so kind of found your I, niche by I accident. I found my niche by accident yeah. there. And then when they closed down, um, I, as a bet, and I, I remember it, there was a lady that worked in their, um, in their body shop and she bet me five pounds that I couldn't get a job as a bar manager for a company called Luminar Leisure. Okay. Um, and I, so I, I applied for the job, won the bet, got my fiver. Um, <laughs> and, and again, that was, for me, that was a real big turning point in my career because I went from somebody that was working behind a reception or, or even somebody that was an apprentice mechanic working behind a reception um, right through to being a service manager. And then when I started off working for Luminar Leisure, I started off as a assistant bar manager, but worked my way up there as a general manager, then moved up to become an area manager. Mm-hmm. And again, it was a real big turning point for me in, in my career. Okay, so great formative years, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. learning in organisations, yeah, yeah. multiple roles in those organisations. Yeah, definitely. So when did you think, uh, um, and when did you actually start your first business and what was it? So my first business started, actually, it, it, I, I got a job as an estate agent. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, this was a real big turning point for me um, because I was working for this estate agent for about five years now, mm-hmm. four or five years. Um, and I got sick of being treated like an employee. Mm. It sounds bad um, to put it like that, but I didn't. I didn't enjoy going to work. Um, you know, very controlling over the hours that you could work. And that's not to suggest that you know I didn't want to work nine to five. I'm talking. You needed to be there early. You needed to finish late. Um, if you missed a beat, you were in trouble. If you didn't hit your sales targets, you were in trouble. If you were two minutes late for work, you were in trouble. Was that the first employer that did that to you? Because obviously you'd, you'd got had jobs. Before. That was that. That was probably the first employer that you would you would really work over and above. And I, I've always been the kind of guy um, in any role that I've worked where for me nine to five just isn't a job mm. that I've had. I've never worked nine to five, you know. So I've always done that a little bit more. But when you're always doing that little bit more, and it's then expected of you. And yeah. then you're pushed and pushed and pushed to the point where you don't feel valued, it's expected. Mm-hmm. I just thought, this just doesn't work for me anymore. Okay. And it was, it was at that point where I made that turning point to then decide that now is the time to open my own company. Fantastic. So what was that? What did you do? So that was an estate agent. Okay. I uh, <laughs> went into competition against my employers. Good. Um, and we went from we went from nothing to one of the largest estate agencies in Northampton. Mm-hmm. Uh, we managed on our lettings portfolio just over eighteen hundred houses. So mm-hmm. we we were a fair size. Yeah. Um, and we were we weren't as strong on the sales side, but certainly on the rental side, we were we were really strong as an agency. Okay. Um, and I quite found my niche with that. Um, and then, you know, I also, along that way, I decided that it was a good time to maybe invest in a few other companies. I had a friend who was struggling with some hair salons and a beauty salon, so we, we, we negotiated a deal and I took those off his hands. Okay. Um, and again, that was a real big turning point for, for me in the business world, um, where 
I've now got this estate agents and these hair salons and beauty salons, but they're losing money. So I had to come up with a solution when as to why. When did they start losing money? Because obviously when you invested, they couldn't have been losing money. So they you... were losing money when I bought them. Um, okay. And I bought them, um, all, to, all truth be told, I paid a pound for them. Okay. Um, you know, so it was a hypothetical pound. We did, you know, we did a paper agreement for them. Um, but I took them off his hands because they were losing money okay. and they didn't know what to do with them. So my first thing was to establish why they were losing money and what I could do to turn that around. And to me, they were losing money because people couldn't get in or people couldn't book appointments because they had to pick up the telephone, but all the staff were always busy. Mm -hmm. And salons that aren't making money can't afford to pay for non-earners, so they had no receptionists. Of course. Um, the next problem was that people would just not turn up. I mean, we're going back, we're winding the clocks back nearly 10 years now, 10, mm -hmm. 12 years. Yeah. So software in that industry just was either really expensive or didn't really exist. Yeah. So I set out on finding software or making software that would fill that void and, uh, and fix that problem. Okay, so at this point you've got no experience of software? None whatsoever. Okay, so you've got these two businesses, mm -hmm. the estate agency is making great money, it's about yep. the biggest in, in your area, mm -hmm. and you've got this loss making operation, Yep. right? And where are you, you know, personally at this time? You know, are, are you are you with anybody? Are you, you know, where, where are you, what's life like? <laughs> Me personally, um, I'd, I'd I'd had a few partners. Okay. Um, I did. I hadn't had anybody particularly serious. Um, you know, I'd had various girlfriends that had lasted two, three months at a time. For me, I was always focused on work. So you're still a single man. Still a single guy. All, all intense, yeah, yeah. Right? Still a single guy. And well, how many hours are you working? Couldn't tell you, probably 100 plus a week. Yeah, lose count, yeah. Easy. You know, I would start work at six, seven in the morning and finish eight, nine, ten at night whenever I finished. Okay. So are you enjoying life at this point? Are you, are you, are you living the dream of For an me, entrepreneur and a millionaire lifestyle at this what, point? What is the dream? What is the dream that everyone, anyone's living? Mm -hmm. For me, I live to work. Okay. Um, some people work to live. Um, but for me, I don't see my work as work. I don't Have you always been like that? Yeah, always, yeah. Were you like that from when you were employed? Um, I in, was, in yeah. In the car business? I, and, and I would say, yeah, when I was okay. in the car business, I, I, you know, I always loved learning new things. Yeah. Um, always wanted to do more, always wanted to do better. If I wasn't in the garage at work fixing cars, I'd be at home fixing cars. Yeah. You know, so for me, that was always the way I was. My friends would be out drinking on the weekends, out partying. I'd be working. Mm. I'd be getting deals done. I'd be doing what I needed to do. Yeah, because what I'm trying to get to is that as, a, as an entrepreneur, see, my thoughts are whether you work for somebody else, t you have an employer, mm. or if you work for yourself, that entrepreneur mindset remains and that, that serves you well, doesn't it, in your own business? Because hugely, yeah, hugely. You, you can do the nine to five at work. Yeah and do the bare minimum, mm -hmm. and that's fine. But yeah. come redundancy time or promotion time, we know which one you're getting we, if you do uh, the minimum, Exactly, right? yeah. If you yeah. do the minimum, you're out the door first. Right? So that's what happens. And then the other thing is that people say, well, my employer doesn't value me. Mm -hmm. Well, if they don't, then somebody else will. Yeah. Right? So, you know, you get promoted one way or another, whether, whether your employer promotes you or somebody else headhunts you, yeah. right? Yeah, although, although, you know, I find that there's a lot of people that will just coast on by. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I come across it all the time. Yeah, people course. that aren't happy with their jobs, they just coast. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't want to take that risk by, I'm going to work that little bit longer. Because they have that attitude of, why should I work longer? No one's going to pay me. Mm. But they don't. what they don't see is that that paycheck might not be immediate. It might be a month down the line. It might be six months down the line. But if you don't put the effort in today, yeah. you'll never see that. And that's the same with entrepreneurship. You know, how many risks do we take every day mm. as an entrepreneur? And you might not get a reward for that. That's right. You know, I've invested hundreds of thousands of pounds into projects that I might not get a reward for. Mm. You know, it's the same as gambling. And that's what business is. You're taking a risk. You're taking a gamble. The bigger the risk, the greater the possibility of the reward. Mm. And, you know, when I look at, I take myself and my sister as great comparisons there, yeah? She has a job, she earns 40,000 a year, which mm -hmm. sounds great. Mm -hmm. um, I have a job that earns 100 plus a year. Mm -hmm. 
but I take a bigger risk to get there. Of course. But I also went through harder times to get there. I've had days when I can't pay my mortgage. I've had times when I haven't been able to pay the staff. I've had times when I haven't been able to pay my car finance. I've had times when bills have left, been gone unpaid for months because you take that risk mm. and you take that risk with the fact that there is a reward at the end of it. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't take the risk, you'll never get to the other side. What have the rewards been, Pete? Because we, we, you know, we, we have entrepreneurs and we're very risk averse in this country. I don't think we're entrepreneurial enough. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then these are the kind of things when I'm speaking to people about setting up their own business, these are the kind of things that they're saying can go wrong. Yeah, yeah. But what goes right? Let's talk about that for a minute. What goes right? OK, I've had countless amounts of cars. Ones that people could only dream of. Yeah. My biggest challenge some mornings used to be which one of my seven cars I was going to get into and drive. Range Rover, Ferrari, Bentley, Porsche, whichever one. Mm -hmm. Take it or leave it. You know, that's a reward. Yeah. Um, so toys, know, right? Toys is a great mm -hmm. reward. Luxury holidays. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I might work hard, but I also play hard as yeah. well. Yes. You know, you need to reward yourself because if you don't reward yourself, there's no point doing all that yeah, work. Yeah, what are you doing it for? You know. So I've, ha I've enjoyed it. I've had luxurious houses, um, you know, expensive watches, tailor-made suits, things that people can't afford in an ordinary life, mm. you know. So they are the rewards for it when things go right. Yeah. You know, you have available cash that people don't have. You don't have, you know, you get to a certain point where you don't have those money worries that people do where they have mm. the budget in life. Yeah. You know, you're going to go out for dinner and everybody's got to figure out what they need to order on the menu because the bill can't come to more than 58 pounds because that's all you've got left. Right. You know, they're the rewards. Yeah. Okay, so we've got those. Mm -hmm. We've got the house, we've got the seven cars, which one are we going to take, yeah. right? But, and you think, you know, that you've arrived, don't you? you yeah, think, yeah, this I, is thought, it. I this thought is I'd it. made it. I this thought I'd arrived. I, yeah. I'm here now, right? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, sometimes, you know, God has other plans for us and, and we, we, and as soon as we get comfortable, it mm -hmm. seems like, because it's happened to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, as soon as I thought, this is it, mm -hmm. you know, and the slide had probably already started as soon yeah. as I thought that. How was that? Because the story now changes, doesn't it? Well, for me, um, I was at a point where I had a software company mm -hmm. that was thriving and doing very well. Yeah. I had my estate agents that were thriving, doing very, very well. Um, and I also have my hair salons, which are doing. So you turned well those well. around. We turned those around. Okay. And we were making good money out of those. Um, but something I learned in business is when you take your eye off the ball, that is where things go wrong. Mm. I thought I'd made it. Um, I thought I've got all this money; it's never going to run out. One of the things I didn't think about was things like compliance, things like the law. Because when you're earning loads of money, you put the, you think that the law doesn't exist. You can buy yeah. whatever you want. Yeah, and you, have, um, and you do have, you do think you've got professional advisors as well, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But the problem with that is, regardless of what happens in accounting, for instance, it's not yeah. your accountant that's responsible, it's you. It's you that's and ultimately responsible. It's quite easy yeah. to forget that sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're the company director. Yeah. So if something goes wrong, um, your manager is not in trouble, that's or right. your employees are not in trouble, ultimately you are the one that's in trouble. That's right. You are the one that has to answer the questions the buck stops at you okay and if something goes really wrong you're the one that's paying the price for it so you took your eye off the ball mm -hmm. what happened so in my estate agency um there was a period of time where we were one one or other reason we were losing money okay you know um and my lettings manager at the time rather than telling me that we were losing money and telling me we needed to deal with that problem it was just easier to move money around our company accounts. Um, it was easier to not register client deposits and use that money because it filled a hole. Um, you know, one of which that I didn't realize, well, I did realize at the time, but you don't realize that you're spending that money on your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, you're where you think everything's fine. You're just robbing Peter to pay Paul if you're not careful. Because right, so you, so you, you have three businesses, mm -hmm. you have a fantastic lifestyle, mm -hmm. but there's a there's a leak in the bucket and a, and a, and a severe leak with yeah. great consequences, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, so share with us what happened. So this would have been back in 2015 now. Mm -hmm. um, so you are nearly six years ago now. Yeah. Actually, in fact, it was almost six years ago to the day, actually. <laughs> um, 
myself and my lettings manager, who was also my partner at the time, okay. I just thought it would never, never, ever mix business of pleasure. <laughs> but I did mix business of yeah, pleasure. It, and it was it was a fatal mistake for me. Um, we'd had a really big argument one afternoon, mm -hmm. um, and she said to me, "That's it, I'm leaving you." And by the way, I've transferred sixty thousand pounds out of our client account. Um, that's going to that's going to fund me to to live my life for the next twelve months. And uh, you can deal with that problem. Um, I didn't really think anything of it at the time, but I just phoned the police and reported it as a crime. In my eyes, it was stolen money. It was a crime. Okay. Um, and they said, you know what? This is civil matter. Um, you yep. need to speak to her. You need to ask her to return the money back. If she doesn't, we'll then look to take it further. Um, knowingly or unknowingly to me she transferred that money with my username and password from our client account so it technically looked like i just transferred it to her myself um, so that was already a big problem for me anyway um, fast forward a few days she transferred that money back mm -hmm. um, which was great but by this point my um, the estate agents was part of a franchise okay and um, i'd had to notify them what was going on um, so they said it's time we do an audit on your accounts and as part of their audit they discovered that there was a quarter of a million pounds missing out of our accounts as well Whoa. or their calculations added up to a quarter of a million pounds okay um, of which they said okay this is a problem you've got deposits that aren't registered you've got landlords rents that haven't been paid um, and now you've got a whole of nearly a quarter of a million pounds in your bank account mm -hmm. you need to replace this money mm -hmm. in seven days right or we're going to do something about it okay <laughs> so and for me i didn't have a quarter of a million pounds yeah. lying around in my bank account i was i was for want of better words um i thought i'd made it i had lots and lots of nice cars but you can't get rid of assets that quickly especially when they're on finance That's right. yes. <laughs> and they've got no value to them anyway um so this was a problem for me so my portfolio was probably worth around about a million pounds. So our franchise said, you know, we, we will broker a deal with an estate agents down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll take the portfolio, they'll plug the hole up. Yeah. Um, and you will walk away with no repercussions. Okay. So to me, that was a really good deal. Um, you know, the estate agency was a business that I wanted to get out of anyway. Okay. I had the software business. By this point, I'd already sold the hair salons. Okay. Um, and I wanted to really focus on the software business because to me, it was a new thing. Yeah. Um, and and I'd, I'd kind of been in that estate agency world for... So you'd had enough of it. Yeah, I had losing money, like you losing said. money. And then obviously your partnership had broken down mm -hmm. uh, in terms of business and uh, at yeah. home. So yeah. it was something... Did you have any inkling, because I obviously know how the story goes, did you have any inkling at that time what was about to happen? Listen, I went home that day. So when we did the deal with the estate agents down the road, okay. I went home that day uh -huh. and opened a bottle of champagne and okay. I celebrated with some friends. Okay. It was the best thing that had happened. I'd got rid of a major problem um, and I was able to start a new chapter and just right. get on my life. Okay. Um, so yeah, we went home, we opened some champagne, we had a party, smoked some cigars, it was great. Okay. Yeah. How long did the party last? Pardon? How long did the party last before? A couple of days. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you mean before reality sunk in? Yes. <laughs> um, I, well, myself and my partner were, after the party, we, we had decided we were going to go our separate ways. So we were clearing our house out. And um, one of my neighbours actually phoned me and said, oh, there's been some police that have come to the, uh, come to the house. Uh, they've left a card. Could you give them a call? So I said, sure, yeah, no worries. So they gave me the number. A couple of days passed, I rang them and they said, oh, you know, we'd like to invite you to the, uh, we'd like to invite you to the police station for an interview. The I said, voluntary interview. Voluntary right. interview this was. <laughs> I said, okay, sure, no problem. Yeah. So <laughs> so I drove to the police station, as you do, in my Range Rover, yeah. parked it outside the front, as mm -hmm. you do. Uh, and as I walked through the front door of the station, they cuffed me and arrested me and put me in a cell. Oh, this is a bit extreme. I've come for a voluntary interview. I thought I was going to get tea and biscuits. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, they had other plans for me. Um, so they don't tell you when you go for a voluntary interview. They don't tell you when you're in the cell what that interview is about. Right. Obviously, I had an inkling of what it was about, yeah. but they didn't necessarily tell me what it was about. 
Um, it was only when I went in for the actual interview that they'd they'd said to me that um, I think around about 120 people had complained to Northamptonshire Police that their money had been stolen and that I'd fled the country. That was what the, that was what was said to the police. Okay, so um, so this sale that had taken place. Yeah, it turned out that it wasn't much of a sale. Okay. Um, so the, the 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 people that had taken over the portfolio were my ex employers. Oh wow! Um, okay. Yeah, and um, ten years prior, when I left their company, I didn't leave on the greatest of terms. Okay. Um, you know, I was their top sales negotiator, and my tiny brain had forgotten that I quite arrogantly had been paid quite a large sum of money from them, mm-hmm. and I just walked out and left the morning of payday and said. Thanks very much. I'll see you never setting up on my own and taking my clients with me. Okay. Uh, but I've forgotten about all of it. Well, you never really forget, but I'd buried it so far to the back of my mind, it wasn't apparent. Yeah, it's 10 years ago. It's 10 years ago. You don't think anybody's going to hold a grudge for that time. Yeah, yeah. So the agency that took over my portfolio wrote to every single one of our landlords and tenants and said that I had taken their money away they would do their best to compensate them but if they wanted to invite them to make a invo- complaint you know if they wanted yeah. to make a complaint to the northamptonshire police yeah, yeah, yeah it would be best that they did that wow see a hundred and i think it was 122 or something okay. people like that complained to northamptonshire so you police. get charged um i didn't actually get charged no okay um i was released on bail mm-hmm. i think they call it bail now in okay. the uk Um, But I had my voluntary interview and I went home that same day. Okay. um, After having my laptop, my iPad, my phone, my watch, everything seized from me Mm -hmm. in my car and, uh, and, uh, yeah, kind of having to travel home and think, how am I going to get on with life now? Um, And this put a real big kind of hold on my life, probably two years. Mm. Um, This would have been July 2015. um, And... I, I employed a really good top solicitor who looked into it for me, cost me a lot of money. Um, and their view was, was that, you know, if we can get a forensic accountant to look at the figures, mm-hmm. um, if it's under 100,000 that they claim is stolen, um, you'll walk away with a suspended sentence. If you make an offer to pay that money back, um, you'll definitely get a suspended sentence okay. and nothing more will happen, really. Right. So I set about my sights on building my software company so that I can have enough money to make sure I could pay this, you know, this, this bill back that potentially might come. Um, you know, so we were building and building and building this software business. So you, whilst this is going on, you've got the lawyers involved. Yeah, yeah, I've got lawyers so they're involved. Doing their they're work, doing and their you're work. you're thinking, you know what? I'm thinking... Let me build this new business. Yeah. And if I can pay that money back, all I'm, well and good. Yeah. Right. Okay. Maybe a delay, but these people will get paid. So you have yeah. good intentions, right? Real good intentions. Yeah. You know, to, I've never been that kind of person that wants to purposely go out and defraud anyone. Of course. That's not who I am. Yeah. Um, and I remember for me, when that estate agency, you know, when that all went down, the biggest thing that hurt the most wasn't losing money. To mm. me, I didn't really care about losing money. Yeah. Not my own personally. It was letting other people down. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I always believed that I was a trusting person. Yeah. You know, I always believed that I was that person that would never steal from anybody, never intentionally go out and cause harm to anybody. So when I let those people down, that that got to me the most. That really broke me, and that mm. that that broke my spirit a lot. To be honest, it took a lot to get over that. Um, you know, so in my eyes, my intention was always there. If I can find a way of dealing with this problem and paying this money back... Making good, right? I'll do it. Okay. Um, and then I can hold my head up high and mm. say, I've done the right thing. Yeah. Until May 2017. Yeah. 21st of May 2017. Mm-hmm. When we went to court for the final hearing. Well, I had three or four court hearings and it kept getting adjourned and... You know, they couldn't work out the amounts of money. The solicitors couldn't agree on things. The CPS couldn't agree on things. They wanted to charge me for half a million pounds, which would have seen me seven or eight years in jail. My solicitors were really fighting. And, and you know, even, you know, despite what happened, they really did a good job. I could never, ever knock that. Um, but I'll never forget, you know, May the 21st, 2017. And we were in the dock. And I remember the judge just said, 
you know, due to the nature of your crime, the length of the time that it's gone over, um, you know, irrespective of the fact that you want to pay that money back. And we were armed with a banker's draft for 100,000 to pay that back. They said, people like you need to learn a lesson that mm. you cannot buy what you want. Yeah. You need to learn that what you did was a crime. Um, and they sentenced me to 26 months in a custodial prison. Wow. wow. And I thought it was a joke at the mm. time. Mm. I thought to myself, this is a joke. Someone's on a wind up. I'm going to go down into wherever they take me. And uh, someone's just going to, you know, tell me it's all over. It's just, an, you know, it's just a joke. It's all over. I didn't really take it seriously. Um, yeah, but I remember, and I'll never forget, I was looking out into the, the courtroom and, you know, I, not many people have been to a, a Crown Court and it's a lot different to a magistrate's court mm -hmm. for some sort of CCJ. When you go to the Crown Court, you're looking into a big courthouse. There's a jury there. There's everything there. And you walk in one door on the right and you think you're going to go back out the same door, mm -hmm. but that door doesn't open when you're sentenced. The door on the left opens and there's a guy there with some cuffs ready to cuff you and take you down into the cell. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality doesn't kick in at that point yet. Right. You know, you've still got your identity, you've still got your clothes, you've still got your shoes, you've still got your sort of possessions and you've still got some hope that you may actually go home that day but you're there um, and then when they you know then when they take you from that cell underneath the courthouse which you spend most of your day there and mm -hmm. if you're unfortunate enough to go to court early in the morning mm. you're there till the end of the day okay like from 10 o'clock in the morning through till seven o'clock at night when you're transported out mm. of that of that court um, and then you're transported to a prison and you still believe it's a joke at this time. Um, so you're in denial, aren't you? Your brain's yeah, yeah, thinking, this cannot completely be. Completely in this denial. This can't be happening to me. It's not happening. Yeah. It's, it's happening to somebody else. Mm. It's just a horrible joke. Um, you know, and then you walk through the door of that prison and you kind of present it with a reception desk and you're now a number. Mm -hmm. You're no longer a name. You're a number. Okay. D, DZ118 or something like that, I can't remember now. Mm. <laughs> but you're now, you know, you don't have a name, you're a number. Your clothes are taken off you, so you've now lost that last piece of your identity that you have, because you don't realise, um, you know, you don't realise till you haven't got the opportunity to wear them. Your clothes make up a big part of who you are. Um, it's part of your identity, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is. Your clothes are your identity. Can I ask, do you have you. a tailor-made suit on? I did have a tailor-made suit on, yes. Okay. <laughs> How did that feel, taking that off? Um just doesn't you don't really feel like it's happening to be honest mm. um you know you don't really know what to think i mean i remember when i left i was, I was living in a penthouse mm. apartment in you know beaufort park in central london um you know if you'd have looked at my apartment the day that i went to court you would have thought that i was coming home that day mm. with dishes in the sink clothes in the washing machine you know i didn't so you were definitely not prepared. Definitely wasn't prepared. Yeah. My solicitor actually told me, she said, you want to pack a suitcase, mm. take 500 pounds cash with you, because you'll need that. And I took nothing. I had 20 pounds in my pocket. Um, I didn't even write any of the telephone numbers down for people that I needed to know. Was that a mistake? Um, yes not and no. In living in denial? Because your solicitor's clearly advised you correctly. I think this is likely to happen. I think if I'd have lived thinking that it was going to happen, that I was going to go away, I wouldn't have lived my life. I wouldn't mm. have built that second business mm. um, or third business even. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have built it because I would have been constantly thinking, I'm going to go to jail, I'm going to lose everything anyway. Yeah, yeah. You know, there was always a little niggling in the back of my mind, an inkling that I was going to go to jail. Yeah. Uh, and it could happen. But I just lived for the moment and I lived in that world saying it's not going to happen. So I lived, you know, I lived and built a business. So how long did you serve? Um, I served eight and a half months okay. of that 26 month sentence. Right. Um, and again, something they don't tell you or you don't know when you first go to jail is that, you know, I was going to serve half of that sentence mm. in a custodial prison. The other half you serve out on probation. Yeah. Um, but on top of that, if you've got somewhere reasonable that you can live, 
um, you know, you can serve another six months of that sentence on what they call home detention curfew, which is a tag. Right. Um, so you're allowed out of the house from eight o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock in the evening. So physically, out of that 26 months, was it? Yeah, out of that 26 long, months. How much did you spend in prison? Eight and a half months and a in half a custodial months. prison. So you came out when? About, was it about three years ago now? Yeah, yeah, just over three years ago now, February okay. the 8th, yeah, 2018. Okay. And so you come out, everything's gone. Yeah. Um, when yeah. you, that, that, those first few weeks while I was in jail, they were probably the worst few of weeks course. of my life ever. You know, week number one, my business partner at the time wrote to me and said, you know, you've broken the clauses of our contracts that we had together, so we're going to take your shares of the company not. away from you. So me thinking that I was going to go to jail being pretty wealthy and come out being even more wealthy, those plans were completely shattered. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of discovered that day that I'd lost that business. Um, and then, you know, something I hadn't really banked on um, as part of my jail sentence was the Proceeds of Crime Act. Okay. Um, so, you know, they, my bank accounts were frozen. So my house, I couldn't pay my mortgage for a year. Um, my cars were taken off me. Any cash that I had in the bank was taken away from me, my pensions were taken away from me, my savings were taken away from me, and my possessions were seized, what were in my apartment at the time. So you literally go back to rock bottom with nothing. Okay, so that was early part of 2017? Yeah, that was the early part of 2017. Okay, so you come out? Come out with 361 pounds. Oh, wow. I earned that while I was in jail. <laughs> I was proud of that. Yeah, I was proud of that. So, life really has to begin again. Yeah. Except now you've got a criminal record. Yeah, yeah, now you've got a criminal record, so it's even harder to get a job. Yeah. Um, you know... You how, do you, how do you... Because there's, there's huge numbers, aren't there, that re-offend. Mm. Can you understand why they do that? That's yeah, I do, actually. Yeah, I do, actually. Yeah. Um, when, I was, when I spent my time in jail, yeah. um, I did a lot of different schemes. So I did a housing and welfare rehabilitation scheme. Yeah. As in, I worked there helping people get their own housing. Yeah. Um, I worked for what was called the Shannon Trust, teaching people how to read and write in jail, even though I couldn't read and write that well myself. <laughs> but the, in the jail population, only 5% of people in UK jails can read or write. Yeah. Um, and I used to talk to so many prisoners, and I'd ask them why they were there. Mm. And it was always for petty crime, or they would sell drugs, or they would steal, things like that. There were no great masterminds in jail. Well, there probably are a few around, yeah, but there were no, know you know, you in the jail that I was in, there were no okay. masterminds, so they'd well, re-offend because that was all they could do. We could, we could talk about that forever and a day, mm. about the reform system and, and whether there is rehabilitation or not. Yeah. But, you know, time waits for no man, so, you know, we Indeed. want to move along because there is an ending to this story, mm. uh, which, we, we, you know, I'm obviously aware of. Yeah. So you came out of prison and you think, right, I want to start business again, right? Yep. You and just you do did. it. Yeah. You just, you know, you have to put all of those faults to one side. Yeah. Um, and there are a few, again, there are always a few trigger moments of things that happened mm. as I came out. And strangely enough, an old, an old customer um, from my estate agency days phoned me. Mm. Um, and I remember he said, oh, you know, um, we, you know, we need a website building and somebody's built it for us and we don't really know quite know what to do. Um, you know, is there something you can do to help out? And I thought, you know what? I know how to build websites. I've done a little bit of this from my software days when we were building software before. Yeah. So I built the website and, you know, they paid me for it. And I thought, wow. Whole new idea, whole new business. I've earned some money here. <laughs> I've been paid to build this website. Yeah. It was a couple of hundred pounds. But, yeah. you know, when you got nothing, a couple of hundred pounds is a lot of money. Yeah. Um, you know, and then from back in my old days when I'd had these salons and I used to have a lot of connections in that world, people just started, I don't know, they just, people just started asking me if I could help them build websites. And before I knew it, I'd had another person that came along asking for a website to be built. And then somebody else asked for one to be built. And then what eventually happened is, you know, I then thought, hold on a second, I'm onto something here. Maybe this could be a business. Um, but that didn't come without its own challenges as well. 
So what I really wanted to do was I really wanted to get back into that scheduling software world. I thought, well, you know, what, I'm going to take on my ex-business partner. We'll build some scheduling software and, you know, we will, I'll, t I'll take him on. Um, you know, little did it occur to me that, you know, my old software company was 10, 12 years old. Yeah. It had a lot of development. You know, I'm trying to rebuild 10, 12 years work in six months. You know, so I've employed developers, I've managed to borrow some money from my mum, I'm, I'm really scrabbling around trying to pull all this stuff together, and we're trying and trying, it never really quite gets off the ground. Um, and then, you know, one day, um, you know, I've kind of, I'd started working with a personal trainer as well, because I decided that I wanted to take care of my fitness, what I looked like, things like that. Um, you know, so for me, um, you know, I'd start to take care of other aspects of my life as well. Stop drinking, um, start to look after my diet, start to go to the gym. And then this trainer that I was with asked me if I wanted to come to this, um, this uh, what was it called? Power to Achieve event. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if anybody else had have asked me to go to that, I would have said no. Go to some happy, happy mm -hmm. event. Yeah. Um, and I, I'd have said no. But, you know, again, he asked me if I would go to that. So I did. Um, and that was where things really took a turn in for me. You know, I met your good self there. Yes, um, indeed. You know, and then business went from strength to strength. We built a full proper company out of it. And here we are today, three years on, with a, a real business that's really doing well and really striving to make differences in the country. Fantastic. Amazing story, Peter. It's not the end. It's no, just the beginning. no, it's just the beginning, really. I really hope that our viewers appreciate um, we're not here to judge, mm. you know, you've been, you've faced your, your trial, you've done the time, I, you yeah. know, as I said to you when we first met, that it's done, it's the, it, the past is the past. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right, what's the future? So future's looking good, you're an entrepreneur again? Hugely looking good, yeah. Right? Very busy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> extremely. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and again, resilience. Yeah. Right? You know, never knowing when to quit. Somebody asked me, you know, not that long ago. How mm. do you how do you lose everything mm. and just get up and do it? Mm. And you know what? The only answer I could give them was you just have to do it. Everybody fails in life. Yeah. Everybody fails in life at some stage. There's always going to be adversity somewhere. There's always going to be something that goes wrong. But failure is not really a problem. Yeah. It's when you quit that's the issue. You know. crystallizes failure doesn't it when of you quit it does. when you quit and you say that's yeah. it i've had enough and you put that gauntlet down that's when you've really failed and you getting lose. something wrong mm. losing a business deal losing some money losing something it's going to happen to everybody it's part and isn't it it's part it's, of the business yeah you know but you haven't really failed the only time you really fail is when you quit thank you and so that's much the only way of doing for it. sharing your story really appreciate it you're welcome uh, i'll see you in the office in the morning yeah <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for watching today. Um, and, you know, another episode comes to an end. Um, so just wanted to let everybody know that the Cam Joe House show is taking a break. So we'll be back with you in August, uh, planning some new ex guests and uh, a slight change. So I should be taking a break from you. It's been really, really enjoyable presenting the show and I, and I will be back. Uh, but it's time uh, for us to rethink and have a break in the summer. I hope you enjoy the time that uh, you're away from me. Uh, so I shall be preparing for the, for the next uh, season of shows that we have. So immensely enjoy the support that I get from you, the phone calls, the emails, the social media messages. Keep those coming, because we're still here. So I will see you back in August. Have an amazing uh, summer holidays, and I will see you soon. Take care and good night. Here we go.